Welcome, everybody. My name is Tom Dennis. For those that uh, don't uh, know me, I'm the CEO of Serenity and Leadership. I'd like to uh, just introduce Francis. Francis has over 40 years experience in the oil and gas industry. He's a founding member of Powerful Women, which is a professional initiative working for greater representation of women at the top of the UK's energy industry. He's the director and chair of the audit committee of SBM Offshore, which is the world's largest offshore floating production facilities provider. He's also the executive chair now of SML, which is a biotech spin out from Raft. Uh, and they're commercializing a wound healing device to heal without a skin graft. And this is a world first in a $20 billion market. He's uh, also previously been a non-executive director of Britannia Building Society. He's been the chairman of Petroleum Geoservices, chairman of CH4 Energy, the CEO of Amarada Hest. He's been the chairman of the CBI, and he's been president of the UK Offshore Operators Association. It is with some humility that I invite you, Francis, to take the the floor uh over to you okay well I, I don't think it should be with any uh humility i mean you can only uh see by looking at me and my uh, photograph that uh, some would have me in the camp of male pale and stale so i have a lot to learn okay but hopefully one of the things about having a lot to learn uh is one's listening and concentrating and figuring out what one can pick up from others. And that's what I'm certainly also hoping to do today. But maybe I've learned one or two things on the way. So why am I interested in diversity and inclusion? Um, and it, my interest really comes uh, from a number of um, areas, but before I get into that, why do I think this topic has become an imperative? Not just a nice to have, not just politically correct, but an absolute imperative. And really at a, at a helicopter level, the way I look at it is that, I mean, just look at the past two, three years. We've got COVID-19, We've got climate change, and these are two things that are shaking the pillars of every society that we're in, and they're shaking the pillars of every company and how they actually operate and need to operate and function. And if one steps back from it, in a way, we're returning to an earlier era, and in an earlier era, people understood that Mother Nature was all-powerful. We've kind of got rather arrogant in recent decades, thinking that we can control things, and we're learning very fast that we can't. So as I see it, every business, every single business is affected by these changes, not in just what they do, but actually critically in how they do it. And it's the how that I think drives this topic. So certainly in all the businesses I'm involved in and what I'm seeing, and this is both a threat and an opportunity, we ha we're having to radically respond to those two challenges in everything that we do. And this transformation is only just beginning, it's not over. And we're probably actually only on the really early steps of it, particularly if you include clim climate change. Um, and uh, there is nothing in my view that we don't touch or think about that isn't affected by these topics. So I would offer some thoughts about what that really means in terms of looking at one's business, what one does oneself and one's own values. Is old eyes and old ways of working are only going to lead to incremental improvements and change. And actually many of these two big effects are actually needing radical thinking and radical change. 
And you don't get that with old eyes and old ways of working alone. Um, and the other thing that they also call for is not just more eyes, different eyes, eyes with different perspectives, but they also, I think, um, have the opportunity or the need to, in some case, invert hierarchies. Some of the young tech savvy people in one's organizations are gonna be the people who are gonna come up with the answers, not people who are steeped in ways of working and can't uh, find new patterns. So I said I would talk about why I was interested in this and how I got interested in this. Um, well, the first thing is I actually have a rather diverse background. Now it's not perhaps diverse in today's world, but it was, I won't tell you how old I am, but it was when I was a child. Uh, and when I was a uh, child, I did my education in the uh, French system, partly in London and partly in Paris. I used to spend all my holidays in Austria. And critically, I was speaking more than one language at a very young age. And we now know that that actually physically changes the way the wiring is in your head. And actually, um, surveys around that show that it tends to make you less judgmental, which is pretty useful. Um, if you want not just diversity, but you actually want inclusion, which is the critical piece. Now, the, the next piece sounds, sounds a bit like a cliche. Okay, I've, I've obviously got a wife, but I've also got a daughter, and I've got two uh, granddaughters. Um, and what does that mean? Yeah, 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 I want to be nice. No, what it means is it gives me a chance to see the world occasionally through their eyes. And that helps me to actually understand, A, the challenges they have, B, the opportunities they have, but C, the contribution that they can make uh, to what we need to be doing. Um, I suppose if I had to be characterized by anything, which has been, you know, I'm large corporate, and I'm also an entrepreneur. Um, what I really like doing is solving impossible problems with working with other people. In fact, I'll probably go so far as to say, I'm not clever enough to do all of that on my own. So really what I like to be is, is the froth on other people's champagne. It's mine. And that's a really exciting place to be, to be working with other people to actually solve problems. So with that said, what are some of the things that I think I've learned in business um, and as one of the founders of Powerful Women? And why, why, in fact, was I even interested in powerful women in the first place? Um, I noticed that there are some of you are in the energy sector. And one of the things I concluded a long time ago was that the energy sector was not going to survive without radical change. And it was not going to get radical change without using, A, all the talent it could get its hands on, stop losing talent, which it keeps doing all the time and getting new and creative ideas, which it could not do without diversity and inclusion. And uh, for me, it really works. So I like to be surrounded by people who don't agree with me, who have different perspectives. And together we come up with answers that actually no one person entering the room could have done, but together we come up with something which is quite, quite different. So what about a few practical examples? So um, my time at Hess, one of the things that we needed to do was to figure out how to drill wells substantially cheaper. And by substantially, I mean 30 to 50% cheaper. And everybody said it couldn't be done. You know, things were worked in one department, passed to the next, to the next, to the next. And we never seemed to make any progress in improving costs. And then what we did is starting to get people together get people to actually understand each other, trust each other, respect each other, have a dialogue, and then start examining the problems together. And those groups to include not just the engineering men who would keep coming up with the same answer, but people from different disciplines with different ideas and different perspectives. First well we drilled was one third cheaper. 
And we did it by saying, what is the cheapest that has ever been done in every single section of the well? Add it together, that's the target. How do we go about delivering that? That got the engineers on side who said, oh, this is all pie in the sky. And they suddenly said, oh, okay. So it has been done, it's just never been done together. And then by people working together, all those specifications that have been given from one lot to the next lot that actually forced up costs, people start saying, well, maybe we could live with this or that and ending up by very different uh, answers with, with the dialogue. Another one was um, we used to run the gas fields by the production engineers managing the reservoir. And we actually, who were male engineers, and we handed over the running of the fields uh, to a largely female workforce that actually ran the marketing of the gas. And we started making real money. So we ran the fields for the customer instead of running the fields for the engineers who were playing around with the, uh, with the fields. Um, and here's a lovely little story, which is um, maybe apocryphal of what's been happening in Scotland recently with power, gen power delivery. Something called the honey bear story. I don't know if any of you have ever heard the honey bear story. This is a true story of a Canadian uh, company that had a terrible problem that in winter, the power lines would ice up. The weight of the ice would bring down the power lines. And the biggest problem that the company had is it constantly had problems of being able to supply customers. And it got to the point with the regulators and the customers that if it did not solve this problem, this company was gonna go out of business. So they put together some cross diagonal groups within the company, all the way from secretaries, right the way up to board members, men, women, engineers, marketing, all sorts of different people. And they started working the problem. And they weren't, didn't make a lot of progress. And towards the end of the process, there was a group that came together. And the group came together and was trying to figure out, okay, how can we stop the, how can we get these power lines repaired more quickly? And one of the secretaries in the morning session, early in the day saying, you know, I've been thinking about this problem and we can't get the engineers out there, but out there, there are bears. Is there some way we could use the bears to actually help the problem? And you know what it's like in a room when somebody comes up with a light idea like that. Everybody's terribly polite, but mentally they've already judged this person is an idiot and I'm not listening to this person. A little later in the morning, this woman came up and said, look, I've been thinking about the bears some more. What about if we put honey on the poles that carry the power lines? so that the bears would come to the poles and maybe that would somehow, or maybe they'd sort of shake them a little bit and that would, that would solve our problem. And by this time, you know, people were a little less patient. They said, and I can't remember the woman's name, but for argument's sake, Mavis, why don't you, we have got a really a serious problem. Would you please stop wasting our time with stories about bears, which is less than helpful. And they all went off to lunch. And after lunch, one of the senior engineers came back and said, you know, I've been thinking about, I get emotional when I tell this story because it is so important, I think. He said, Mavis, I've been thinking about what Mavis said. If we could somehow or other shape the lines, maybe we could solve the problem without having to send engineers out there. And the eventual solution is they fly helicopters above the lines, downdraft, creates turbulence, shakes the lines, drives the snow off before it can turn to ice and they don't have a problem. And it's known in the company as the honey bear solution. Now I call that diversity and inclusion. That's what that did. And that is an idea that no one person could have come up with. 
and nobody would have come up with without the dumb question that forced people to look at something differently. I've got plenty of other stories, but for the, for the expediency, I, I won't do so. So the last thing I wanted to touch on is that actually diversity and inclusion, I think, is much easier than might be feared. I know that's not necessarily what people think generally. And it's also more fun. It's actually more fun to be working with people. So I think the first thing everybody has to do, men, women, whatever they are, is to accept that you're biased. You're all biased in different ways, but you are all biased. And you need to look for ways for compensating for that bias. And that needs to be both people ways and process ways and procedure ways. So the first thing, which is kind of blindingly obvious, is what some people call active listening. But it's, I, I like to describe that a little bit more and say it's actually about listening and you try as hard as possible when you are listening, firstly, not to switch off before the other person is finished talking because you've already formed a view and not to exercise any judgment at all. Just perceive it and let it go in before you actually start evaluating it. And do so no matter where that person is in the hierarchy, because that person may be sparking a thought like Mavis that you never had or could never have. Um, and the beauty of ideas that are less than perfect is that they really do often spark things that couldn't have been dreamt up by just keep traveling down the same old logical path. And above all, um, be humble. And I would argue that we're heading to a world in which experience is going to count for less and less. Uh, and actually diverse thinking is gonna count for more and more. So self-awareness, be curious, be intensely curious. Really listen to what people say and see if you can get a different perspective. Be courageous. Be prepared to say, you know what? I'm talking rubbish. Can somebody else help me with this? Can we talk about this? Can I understand why you asked the question you just asked or why you said what you just said so that you can get some understanding and, of course, some empathy? So... Um, that's just a little bit from my experience of life and working with uh, people which I share. Uh, and I'm eager to learn uh, what I can from you guys as well as we have the follow on session. Thanks very much, uh, Francis. Thank you. Francis, you, I know you've been thinking about what's been said. Do you want to, from your point of view, bring things together? Yeah, uh, happily. So first of all, I've really enjoyed listening to different ways of the different ways that people are looking at this and summarizing it. And the things I picked up from all of that is at the beginning, there was one word which was, or a couple of words which were common to everybody, um, latching on to active listening and the importance of active listening. So I think everybody as far as I could hear, thought that that was really important. Second thing I heard was the different ways in which you described diversity and inclusion. And that said two things to me. One is, these are words that are used but have different meanings to everybody. So one of the things that we should be striving for is to be really crystal clear within the groups that we work on. What do we mean by diversity? And what do we mean by inclusion? And for, for the words to actually be turned into meaning rather than just words, which is what they very often are. And I heard some very interesting ways in which that was being described. Um, I heard things like, um, you know, owned collectively, which I think lots of people don't, in a hierarchy, don't think about. They think it's handed down. Mm. Um, I, I, um, how much what those words mean is perceived differently depending upon what your experiences are, where you come from uh, and what you've lived. And actually 
if one can share that, that brings richness and it brings understanding, but it also demands respect to create the space within which that can happen. Um, and I was very interested in the idea that actually some of this is owned by our bodies and turns into DNA mm -hmm. and isn't uh, just an abstract uh, concept. And then I heard um, um, an important voice about education and the words that also went through my head as I was hearing that was actually a lot of what the leader's job is about re-education, mm -hmm. i.e. doing what schools do not do. And we better not wait for schools to be perfect. We better start getting good at being re-educators as leaders because life is too short. Um, and also the concept that everything is interconnected but uh, of course that interconnection leads to complexity, which then loses your audience. So finding, sim finding a path for the journey of a thousand steps uh, or a thousand miles, which starts with the first step is really important, I think as a leader's uh, role. And then lastly, there was quite a lot of talk, I think about processes that might work. Quite a lot of concern about how do you create the space within which actually the muddle, I think that was used as the, as the words, uh, can be allowed to emerge and not be crushed by logic immediately. And so then I thought it might be useful if I offered a few ideas about practical things to do. So just building on that last one, the first practical thing is everybody starts with the non-intellectual answer and back rationalizes. Almost everybody does that almost all the time. We do not work in straight lines. And actually, if you can get people to, you, you know, rather than get them to admit, which sounds kind of, um, confrontational, if you can just say, okay, help me to understand how did you get that? Did you have the idea first and then work out the logic that went with it? Or did you work through it step by step to get to the answer? And if you can get people to share that, in fact, most of the time they had the answer and they worked out the logic to go with it later, um, then you're, you've already made some progress. Second thing to say as part of that is, unless you can work out the logic to go with the intuition, you cannot lead because other people cannot understand. They have to be instructed. They have to be managed, not led. So it is really important to spend the time, you know, at the end when so, well, that sounds like a fantastic idea. Now, how do we turn that in the logical steps that people can understand that that is the right answer or, or a sensible answer or a useful answer? So I would offer that as one practical step. Um, there are really practical things to do, like um, to create this sort of space of inclusion and diversity instead of evaluating what somebody says when they've opened their mouth, the first question you ask is, help me to understand why you feel that or why you think that. Take me on your journey, because actually you learn a lot more from that than you do from uh, just the ding dong of uh, challenge. And buddying is quite a good trick as well. So as a leader, I often find somebody else on the board or whatever and say, I want you to watch me. And when I've missed asking somebody who you think in the group could have contributed, will you help me to make sure that that person is brought in? When I'm talking too much, will you give me a little sign to shut up? <laughs> um, or afterwards, will you tell me if there's something that I did that wasn't particularly useful, you thought, so I can learn faster? So buddying, I think is quite useful. And the last thing I would say, which is really important about leadership is summarizing. So at the end of the day, you've got to bring people uh, together. Otherwise it's just a muddled conversation around the fireplace. Interesting though that may be, everybody walks out with a completely different idea and that's not very helpful. So somehow or other one's got to uh, summarize at the end. So active listening, um, really understanding diversity, being ready to re-educate, and as a leader, being ready to behave in ways that actually encourage and permit inclusion. I think that's what I got from this conversation. Well, Francis, thank you.
Thank you. It's been a delight to have you join us. So you've, you've given us some very simple, but I think quite profound thoughts to take away. Okay, so thank you all. I, I do wish you um, a good time in, in the, <laughs> over the time that some people will be taking holidays. Um, Francis, thank you again, and thank you all. And uh, we'll send you a link to the video as soon as it's ready. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.